Egyptian fans and ponies. This is not a <coughs> seminar where you sit like inanimate objects and listen and don't contribute. This is a small crowd, it's an intimate crowd, so you can actually contribute. Feel free to interrupt the speakers. Last year we had three speakers. The first speaker stood up, Paul, and welcome back, Paul. The second speaker stood up and said, it was brilliant listening to Paul, but I fundamentally disagree with X. And you could feel people going, what? And the third speaker stood up and said, great listening to Paul and Pam this morning, but I actually disagree with both of them. Now the fun part was that all three were chefs. That was the challenging part. And it was fun to hear from their different interests, their different backgrounds, where they disagreed. So I can see this morning, and I, what I want this morning is that you are not silent. You hear something that Paul says and you don't like what he says, you tell them. He's well used to being um, confronted by people who disagree, but he's also well able to respond. I was a lousy debater in school, absolutely appalling. And I love public speaking, but I love watching people debate. Everybody here is interested in food. You're, interest, you're here because you're interested in food honesty and integrity. So make your voices heard. Uh, before we start, I have to thank a few people. The Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, um, in the name of Geraldine Hayes, for all the help I have received and support. I came in last year and they looked at me and said, you want to what? Here? And you're not employed in the civil service? Mm. <coughs> they allowed us in last year. I'm thrilled that we were permitted to come in again this year. And we've moved from the Department of Agriculture building per se in here into Boldish Gawara, the Seafood Development Centre, an amazing centre where some incredible seafood products have been developed. Don't forget to look at the packaging, look at the products, how many you recognise. Many of these are on the export market, they're not just confined to Ireland. And a big thank you to Gloria Corcoran, who has sort of steered me in where to go and what to do, and just steers everybody else as well. So the three um, graduate students who are sitting in this morning, you're very welcome. Your voices count as well, so make them heard. Um, and before we go any further, there's things like housekeeping. I did all the preliminary work. Okay. Now, Gloria will tell you what has to be done if X, Y, or Z happens, which it won't, <coughs> but just in case. Gloria. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I know lots of your faces. I've met a lot of you before. I had the pleasure of meeting a lot of you before. Just to let you know, this is the only seafood development centre, or indeed in Ireland and possibly Europe, for just seafood and seaweed. So, I'm very proud of it, but we wouldn't get to where we are without the students. And we have a new batch of students in behind you and talk to them. We have master students and we have people with masters who come in <coughs> after they've done their uh, graduated and they're coming in to go out to industry with us. Uh, we send them out to industry and they, <coughs> they help, they develop, they're the future of Irish seafood and to add value to Irish seafood. Anyway, just to let you know that in the event of a fire, you go through that door and down to this double set of doors at the end of the corridor and down the stairs. And that, not this stairs here, that stairs is a, a safety fire target for up to half an hour. So that's where you go and we meet at the front of the staircase. The other thing is, out of courtesy to our wonderful speakers, Paul and Mary and uh, Neve. Neve and Neve, please turn off your phone. Wait till you would do that right now, please. Thank you very much, and enjoy. Has something to say to you first? Come on, Gloria. I haven't, I haven't even started. I'm Facebook living this, by the way. Yes. So uh, <laughs> feel free to put the phones on silent, but if you want to tweet or put up any comments, by all means, please do. Great. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you this morning and to be part of the uh, Avril's team, together with Jervie and others who just come together and believe in Avril's mission. She's a strong force, if you don't know her before today. Um, delighted to welcome you to her community. I think West Cork, Cork, Ireland and beyond. 
would be lost without the passion, the energy, and the enthusiasm that Avril, with her family and her two fabulous um, sons and her husband, worked together to really deliver a fabulous, you know, quality, authentic, and all what is what we wish to have on our plate. And um, coming into our world and being part of our community, I'm um, really grateful. So thanks, Deborah. And um, this morning to present. You know, somebody that we've learned last year, and as I was speaking to some of you this morning and saying, you know, why isn't the house, you know, full? Why isn't it sold out? You know, we're, we're starting, we're getting there. But my own belief is that some people out there just don't want to hear the facts. They don't want to hear a little bit controversy. They, want, they don't particularly want to hear what's good, bad, or ugly. So therefore, they like to go to what's, you know, in the mainstream and popular. So hopefully, you know, our plan is that we'll help convert some of those by keeping with us and just delighted to have Paul back this morning. As controversial he is, um, I've, I've become a follower. He's over 100,000 followers. He's not just renowned for his fabulous restaurant in Killarney. Coming from Dublin, as we all know, you might hear from my accent, blow in is not easy. He came to Kerry, I came to Cork, and um, he's uh, fabulously out there, not only in, in cookery, in travels, in documentary, also wrote a book, um, and he's just come here to share with you this morning of where his passion came from, where what he does to make a difference in his community and beyond, and share that with the greater public. And as Avril said, you might not agree with it all, you might agree with it all, but let's just have a discussion, and uh, most of all, enjoy the morning, and thanks for all for coming along. Well, what an intro. <laughs> okay, so we might as well just get a couple of fundamentals out of the way. First of all, in the words of Donald Trump, I'd like to welcome all three and a half thousand of you here. It's great. <laughs> Such a packed audience. Yes, I'm bald. Yes, I'm fat. And yes, I'm wearing a pink shirt. So I clearly really don't give a damn what most people think. Uh, last oh, year... Oh, I, who? Trevo. Spelled. Oh, Chase, there's always one. T-R-E-Y-V-A-U-D. Now... Last year I was asked by Avril and I thought I'd said enough to make sure I was never asked again, but <laughs> apparently that didn't work and it spectacularly backfired, but I'm delighted to be back here again. I think I started off last year by saying, I don't want anybody to think like me, but I do want people to think because I think our industry is full of shit, basically. And now, there's a couple of things I need to get out of the way, first of all, and I'm going to give you the origins of two words because I don't really set out to offend people. Some people do take offense. So I'm going to give you the origin of two words because I'm going to use them quite a lot throughout this speech or uh, presentation. And hopefully when I give you the origin of them, you're not going to be offended as much. So the first word is the word fuck. Now most people go, oh, I can't believe you just said that. But when I give you the origin of it, well then you mightn't be as offensive, uh, offended. I don't know if anybody remembers the movie Braveheart. Well, the king came out with this great line. He said, the problem with Scotland is that it's full of Scots. And if we can't get them out, well, we'll breed them out. So he enacted a law which is called Prima Nocta. Now, anybody who studied Latin will know that that means pretty much the first night or the premier night. So when a Scottish couple married, the sitting lord in that area of Scotland, who was the English lord, was allowed bed the wife of the Scottish couple, which meant that the offspring was going to be somewhat English. And that was the mentality of it. So he enacted Prima Nocta. So when this came up with any issue in the world of courts or laws or anything like that, they used to say, well, it was okay because the king knew about it. And it was fornication under consent of the king. Fornication under consent of the king. So it was abbreviated, F-U-C-K. As time went on, we have brought this word in as a bad word. And now we're all thinking that it's actually a bad word. It's actually only an abbreviation. And probably in 100 years' time, the word A-I-B will probably be a lot worse than F-U-C-K. <laughs> The second word which I need to say, because again, you're going to hear me say this quite a lot, is that years ago when boats were sailing all around the world through the Atlantic, the Pacific and all that, they were taking months upon months to get to their destination. And a lot of them never reached their destination and it was always put down very simply as bad weather, storms, bad sailing or whatever, but the boats never reached where they were supposed to be getting until people started putting two and two together as time went on and they realised that underneath the deck, of the boat is where all the poor people went, all the animals went, and where they brought their own fertilizer and their manure. And as they were sailing over, and it was taking them months to get over there, well, we didn't have electricity back then, but what we did have was our little Florence Nightingale candle lights. So when the guys were walking underneath the deck, all of a sudden the methane gas that was built up, explosion. A lot of the boats never reached their final destination. When they realized what was going on, they stamped S-H-I-T on the box of manure and fertilizer and all that, which meant ship high in transport. 
So there you go. Here's the origin of the word shit, which today we deem as a bad word. Again, it's only an abbreviation. Now, my presentation is very much like Billy Connolly. I start off with a point, I go full circle, and I'm going to come back to you and explain to you why I have just really explained the word F-U-C-K and the word S-H-I-T. And for me, it's what's paramount in everything that I'm about to say. So I take huge issue in the world of food because it's just gone nuts. I remember the Fanny Craddocks, the Keith Floyds, the Delia Smiths, where people just actually cooked, did a presentation, it was a 30 minute show, and you went, that was great. Now we have to have a circus act in between the starter and the main course. Now everything has to be like bright lights, sparkly and all that, and we've lost the essence of what it's all about, which is food. We have too many good producers, small producers, in this country and further afield, that dedicate so much time, so much hard work, and they get up and they work 24 hours a day for very little reward, only for the fact that they go to bed at night feeling how passionate I am about what I produce, in what I rear, in what I make, in what I whatever. And to see it bastardized on TV, well then I have to take a serious issue with that because it's one of the few industries that we're allowed to get away with it. Every time that I say, try and put into context in like say, in law or in medicine or in some other very important industry, there's no way it would work, yet we let it happen every single time when we look at some of these idiots and clowns that are now all around the world of social media. So I'm going to start off with social media because I think that this is pretty much the main reason and basically the heartbeat of all this bullshit. Remember, shit high in transport. It's not a bad word, okay? So social media, when you think about it now, look at all these guys that are out there from, from bloggers to this new uh, era of celebrity chef that they've gone off from 100,000 to 200,000 followers on Facebook, on Twitter, on social media, on Snapchat, on whatever it is. Yet in the last kind of three to six months, they were gaining 10,000 followers a month, 20,000 followers a month, now all of a sudden only a couple of hundred. So what's happened? Why has it slowed down? Well, there's a couple of explanations. And again, this is only my opinion. I'm just throwing the spanner in the works to say, hang on a second, have a look at this. It doesn't really add up. So when they started off, you can buy followers. It's very easy. I did it myself on Twitter about two or three years ago before I went on the Saturday Night Show with Brendan O'Connor. And I think at the time, I, I don't know, maybe five, six hundred followers on Twitter. And I said, I'm going to show you within the next 48 hours how my followers are going to treble before I go on the Saturday Night Show because obviously RT were advertising. And the fact of the matter was, was I bought 1,500 followers for I think five euro or 10 euro. I think that's pretty much what it cost me, maximum. Now, as time has gone on, because these are what's known in the world as bots, so they're basically some guy, whether it be in India or Mexico or wherever, tapping on a computer, blah, 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 and these people genuinely obviously don't exist. But you get all these followers, and now all of a sudden, like you hear now, I'm a social influencer, whatever the hell that means. I'm a social influencer with 50,000 followers on Snapchat, 100,000 followers on Twitter. And <coughs> how many of these are real? Who knows? Well, you can now run scans to find out how many they're real. If you run a scan on me, you'll see my Twitter has actually about a thousand fake fans because 500 of them have fallen off since I, I bought them. But these guys now, it's advancing where it's no longer just a bot. It's no longer just somebody who's uh, sitting on a computer. They're now getting more technologically advanced. So now they're beginning to interact. There's sites that you can go on and pay money. So you're in this site and I go in and I say, lads, I'm about to put out a video on Facebook, on Twitter, on this and that. Will you just come onto my page, like it, comment it, to make it look more realistic? So now there's more of a kind of a community feeling. And it's like the rich guy who's got a load of money, money attracts money. Followers attract followers. And this kind of wave can, brings in more and more people all the time. But how many people are genuine followers of the world, in, of these people in social media? I'm not so sure. But when you see a guy who's got over 600,000 subscribers on his YouTube channel, but his uptake is about maybe 15, given best case scenario, 30,000 views of his video will do the maths. 10% of 600,000 is 60,000. 5% is 30,000. So you've got 600,000 followers or subscribers on YouTube, and you've got less than a 5% uptake on who's watching your videos? Doesn't seem right, does it? It's like me talking to you and only one person here in the room listening to me. Doesn't seem right. Go on to Facebook, and you turn around and you see he's got over 200,000 followers on Facebook, yet most posts only take up an average take of likes and comments of maybe four or five hundred people. Give them best case scenario, a thousand people. Again, do the maths. 10% of your 200,000 is 20,000. 5% is 10,000. So we're bringing it down to about a half a percent of the followers on the social media are interacting with the posts that these guys are putting up. So first of all, there's your red flag. Straight away, 
that the numbers are bullshit, that the followers are bullshit, and everybody who's like going along with this wave, it's all nonsense. Now, it might not sound like a lot, but if you add in 10, 15, 20 different examples of that, and you create this machine that looks as if it's a big propaganda machine and it's a big kind of social influence, well, all of a sudden it kind of does become a social influence because these are the people who are now getting onto radio stations. These are the guys who are now on the front pages of the magazines. These are the guys who are now being brought on on TV stations. So all of a sudden, this bullshit has escalated to a massive piece of bullshit. And we're all beginning to believe it because now we're watching them. And we're going, I must follow them. I must interact with them. I must tweet with them. So do you understand what I'm saying? It's like the kind of snowflake falling down the mountain. It eventually turns into an avalanche. And this is what's happening, in my opinion. But that doesn't distract whether these guys have ability or not. Now, I'm very old-fashioned. My father was the executive head chef in Juries and Balls Bridge. When it was Juries, most people would know that here. When it was the, probably the top hotel in Ireland. It's cooked for Elvis, Muhammad Ali, Princess Grace, Frank Sinatra, and anyone and everyone that ever came into the country, my dad cooked for it. He, when he was growing up, worked six days a week with his apprenticeship five days a week, and he went to college one day a week. So he had one day off. No, he didn't. Because the head chef turned around to him and says, what are you doing on your day off? I don't know, I might go play tennis or Michael. No, you're not. You're going down to the butcher. And you work with him every day for the week, for free, until you learn how to butcher every single animal from top to bottom. And when you've that done, you go down to the local fishmonger. And you work for him for free, for one day a week. And then you go down to the fruit and veg guy. And then you go to the pig farmer and the cheese maker and whatever. Because you do not have a day off if you want to be the best. Okay, extreme, 50, 60, 70 years ago. But the point is, is that this is what it took to be a head chef. Dad was the executive head chef of some of the top hotels around the world, working some of the best restaurants around the world. Still alive, thank God, and was my inspiration as to why I'm so passionate about what I talk about is because there's no way I'm going to see what he did being bastardized by some little shit who comes on and says, I'm a self-taught chef. There's no such thing as a self-taught chef. Actually, there is. You're shit. That's why, because you taught yourself, <laughs> and you don't know how to cook. So if I was to teach myself how to play the piano, trust me, in two years' time, I'd still be shit. So when I see these guys on the TV screens, like saying, here's how we make a hollandaise sauce, let's get a couple of egg yolks and throw in a little bit of cubed butter and add in a squeeze of lemon juice, you think a scoffier, that's how he invented a hollandaise sauce? No, it's not. It took him years to come up with it. And this little twit comes up and says that? I'm sorry. And if we continue to show people the wrong way of doing things, it eventually becomes the right way and it eventually becomes the norm. And then people like me are turning around and saying, but just shut up and keep your hands down and say nothing. Just go with the flow. Well, no, I won't go with the flow. Because at some stage, somebody has to put their hand up and say, that's the greatest load of shit I've ever seen in my life. And how can I back it up? Because I'll show you how to make a hollandaise sauce. I'll show you how to put, put a full cow in front of me and a knife. And I'll have it perfectly butchered. Do anything. I'll go out and I'll sh we'll shoot a deer. We'll kill a pheasant. We'll, I'll show you how to gut it. I'll show you how to pluck it. These guys haven't a clue. But they're playing to this massive organization which has become a global, not multi-million, not multi-billion, but a multi-trillion dollar business which is the world of food. And it's all stemming from, as far as I'm concerned, this bullshit snowflake on the top of the mountain that just keeps generating and generating and generating. So we look on at the next thing. We say, look at magazines, for example. Okay, So magazines need people. They need to create these celebrity chefs because we're all falling in for this whole celebrity world that we gotta, we wanna be like intrigued as to what they do in their lives and how they cook and everything. So the magazines create five, 10, 20 different celebrities because what do they wanna do? Ultimately sell their magazine. We can look at everybody who's been around for the last 10 years, probably 30, 40% drop off and then another 30, 40% come up again and they'll be gone in six months, 12 months or 18 months time because it's just who's current, who's new, who's important at the moment and then they fall off and then they disappear. But the magazines keep coming up. It's the same with the awards. The awards, now if you ask most of the restaurateurs in Ireland, the awards that are going to, because we have about five different awards in this country, and they're all the top most important award when they're being released, but they're all bullshit. Because it was the same guys winning all the time until people turn around and say, hang on a second, there must be more than two restaurants in Munster or Leinster or not. How is it always the same people that are always winning? And fair play to them. Trust me, like I said, I really don't give a shit, so I don't care. I'll never get an award off these guys. Apparently, I'm way too controversial. They should actually have a category of most controversial restaurant direction. Maybe I'll have a chance in that. But anyway, so now all of a sudden, they're bringing in more people. But as the world of social media has developed and developed all along, it was incredible how three years running, one of the so-called top awards leaked the results the night before it came out. Let's fucking think about this. Remember, fornication under consent of the king. It's not <coughs> Let's think about this. 
Well, if everybody knows the results beforehand, and coincidentally, we've given a lot of these awards to pretty guys, some guys who are pretty savvy on social media, and I've got a lot of followers, and they're all tweeting, oh my God, I think I'm after winning, I think I'm after winning. Well, guess what happens? The following day, those awards are trending on the launch of the day the book is being sold. Am I being like, you know, a bit too, looking too much into this? Maybe once if you get away with it, yeah, fair play to it, it is coincidental. Second time, yeah, third time in a row, come on, you're talking shite. And this is what's selling, because ultimately, what do they want to do? They want to sell their guidebooks, they want to sell their products, and fair play to them. But can I not put my hand up and say, I totally disagree with what you're doing here, that I think anybody who's lasted through the recession, first of all, is a lot better than somebody who just opened their door and more than likely will be gone in 18 months' time. And there's thousands of these restaurants who have got these awards because they're young, savvy, and they're giving it all this on Twitter and all that kind of stuff, and we're applauding them. Nobody ever turns around in 18 months when these guys go bust and say, do you know that there was six staff who never got paid? Do you know that there's three suppliers who are actually seriously financially in debt because that guy never paid their bills? Do you know the rates were never paid? Do you know the light and heat and all that kind of stuff was never gone? But this guy shows up two weeks later, opens up another place, and he's, oh my God, your man, the guy who won the award last year, whatever, the superhero. Uh, people who watch these celebrity chefs actually follow what they do? In other words, it, does it translate into what they do in the kitchen, or is it all about celebrity? I, to be honest with you, I think we're now so engrossed with the world of the celebrity that we're, you're right, it's more about watching that person. I was very lucky, I, <laughs> I was on TV with Irish TV, and had a very different audience compared to your mainstream RTEs and TV trees, in the sense that, as far as I was concerned, it was genuine, real people watching it. The production value was very poor because we didn't have the budgets of the big TV stations. But what we did was genuine, honest. And we had, like, I don't know if anybody knows of Irish TV, whatever, but there was a couple of, say, like the County Matter shows. And people would look at them and go, geez, the sound is brutal. The cameraman keeps moving, but the content is quality because it's genuine people just talking and being genuine about it. There's no wares and graces and there's no bullshit. So the feedback that I was getting from, because I was turning around saying, for example, there was one guy turn around and he says, here's the perfect Christmas dinner. So he does that, we'd say for argument's sake, 2010. 2011, he's back on the TV, here's the perfect Christmas dinner. And it's completely different to last year. So how the fuck is that possible? How can you have something that's perfect and it's totally different? But what they were coming up saying to me is, you just got a chicken and true salt and pepper and true in the oven. I said, yeah, because that's what most people want. They want to know what temperature, how long, and if it comes out of the oven. So I come out in the show and I say, oh, geez, I actually probably let that in about five minutes. It's a little bit overcooked, or it's a little bit undercooked. But if that happens to you, just throw it back into the oven, or make sure you take it out five minutes sooner next time. And the feedback that I was getting was that it was just genuine, honest to God. There was no airs and graces about it. But I think now, you're dead right, is that it's all about the celebrity. We all hate politicians, but if Leo Varadkar walked in here, we'd all stand up to have our photograph taken with him. And that's the way the world of celebrity is going, is that we're just, we're intrigued by somebody who's been portrayed as being his superstar. But if you delve further into it, and that's what I'm trying to say about social media, is that if you delve further into it, well, you realize maybe they're not quite the superstar that you think it is, because a lot of the followers and a lot of everything that goes with it isn't 100% accurate. So for example, we look at now, is huge companies are now coming on board with social influencers, because that's what they want to be called. They don't influence me for anything, but anyway. So we'll say, like, pick a tin of tomatoes. A tin of tomatoes sees a guy who's on, say, the six o'clock show on TV tree, and says, you know what, I'm going to turn around and we're going to throw 200 euro at you to make a video and to put it out. So your man goes, right, great. Because somebody in that company turned around, who's now the new sales and marketing person, has told the boss and says, do you realize if you put 20 grand into a newspaper ad, we have no idea who actually saw it, who actually read it, who actually you know said, oh yeah, I'm gonna buy that product. But if we put in a video and we turn around, well, we can see who watched it, we can see how many people watch it, we can pretty much get the demographics of their age, of where they live, we can find it. So now we can get 100% value for our money at a fraction of the price. That's why newspapers are seriously struggling at the moment, <coughs> is because it's all going into social media. So the boss man turns around and says, that's brilliant. So they come back and they say, 20,000 people watched the video. Great, it reached 150,000 people. Great, here's the demographics of it. And look, there's six comments saying, oh my God, I'm gonna buy your tin of tomatoes. The boss man goes, money well spent for a fraction of the amount of money. However, the boss man might necessarily know that the guy who made the video could have paid 10 euro to Facebook to boost the post for everybody to see more and more of the ads. How long did they actually watch the video? I guarantee the boss probably didn't see that statistic. But the point being is, is that just because you're seeing views and just because you're seeing demographics on a Facebook, it doesn't mean it's legit. It's probably been bought and paid for. But the biggest problem that these companies, in my opinion, 
is that they're not looking at who they're getting to promote their product. So 200,000 people watched the video with the tin tomatoes, but the guy who cooked with it made absolute shit of it. So is that good for the brand? Let's say genuinely 200,000 people did watch the video. Let's say nobody paid for anything, but this guy hasn't a clue how to cook. And this guy made an absolute mess of it. And there's 200,000 people looking at brand tin of tomatoes. Is that good advertising? I don't know. I personally think it's not because I've seen a lot of these ads that are coming up with, with cheese crackers and all this. And you're looking at it. What are you doing, lads? That's what are you making? Now, most people who might go along with, oh my God, it's great. I'm only watching it because of him. They're probably not looking at the brand anyway. And if you ask them an hour later, what was the brand of crackers? Or what was the brand of tin? They probably couldn't tell you. But the recipes that these guys made, nobody's going to recreate them. Is that good? I don't know. I'm, I'm asking these brands that are out there. Is that good marketing? Is that good advertising? Some people will turn around and say, yes, but 200,000 people now know about us. That's all we wanted. Somebody might turn around and say, well, actually, that was pretty damaging there now for 100,000 people that thought it was crap. Well, I don't know. But that's the way that social media is going now. And you'll see with Facebook, in a few years' time, I don't think there's going to be any TV because Facebook are going to live stream absolutely everything. And you turn around and say, that's crazy. Well, five years ago, we didn't really see Netflix coming. We didn't really see half of what we have now. We didn't see live stream on Facebook, first of all. But now you can live stream everything. Before, it was on your phone or on your iPad. Now you can live stream with one guy behind a, a screen or behind a, a, a monitor with eight different cameras, and he's the guy who's working everything. There's no sound man. There's one cameraman. There's one director. There's one presenter. It's a fraction of the price of TV. So everything is going to be live streamed on Facebook, in my opinion, including movies and everything. They're going to stream everything through Facebook, and TV is going to be in more and more trouble. And is that the, I don't know, that's the way it's going. I've kind of gone off the, off the track here, but... What I'm saying is, is that the social media side of things that these guys are promoting is not everything that you might think it is because you can buy and pay for every post, for every follower, for every tweet. So if you've paid for something, is it legit? If we move on then, we've got, say, stemming on from the magazines is the awards again, as I, as I said. Who gets these awards and who's been invited to these awards? And who? The awards is being seriously damaged now because a lot of restaurateurs are realizing if I go to the top award ceremony, which there's five of in the country because they all claim to be that, if I go to the top awards, it pretty much cost me 500 quid from the ticket to the travel up there to whether it be the new dress or the new suit or whether it be staying in the hotel or it's cost me 500 quid. What the hell did I go up there? I know damn well I've no chance of getting it because it's going to be the same five or six guys who are getting it. And after a while, that goes through a lot of people. So there's an awful lot of restaurateurs who now refuse point blank to go to these awards because they're just going, it's, I wouldn't say it's fixed, I wouldn't say it's rigged, although... But it's just, it's not right, and it doesn't seem legit, and people are sick and tired and fed up with it. Again, this is all streaming down from the social media, the magazines, the size of it. We've got our food critics. I don't know if anybody saw any of the posts. I borrowed three food critics from my restaurant for being full of shit. And the first one was, was Katie McGuinness, because she turned, or Kathy McGuinness, Katie McGuinness for the Times, I think. She, a few years ago, she put a, an article into the magazine, in Glass Magazine, saying, Try finding a decent value meal, and I'm pretty much quoting word for word verbatim here, in Killarney. You can't. If you want an example of rip off Ireland, here you go. Wrote off an entire town to say, don't go to Killarney, it's a rip off town. Three years ago, three, four years ago, in Gloss Magazine. About three or four months ago, we had an article of a restaurant that was done in Cork. I don't know, some of you might know which, what it was. There was a delay. The starters were okay. Both main courses were overcooked, but when you're paying for quality ingredients like this, which is from Ballymaloo, well then you expect to pay top dollar. 200, 190 euro for dinner for two. Remember, both main courses are overcooked and they're not, not a great experience. Eight out of 10, eight out of 10. Value for money, eight out of 10. For 200 quid, for dinner for two, and Killarney's a rip off town? So I turned around and I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to call your bluff on that and say you're barred because you're full of shit. It was, I don't even know if she stopped off. It. Actually, good question. I don't even know. Well, having said that, I should have barred him too. There's another very famous so-called restaurant critic who turned around and said the best way to view Killarney is from the rear view mirror of your car. As in, drive past it. Don't look. Don't, don't go into the town at all. Why did you need to be the artist? Though? Well, the funny thing was is he was invited back about four or five years ago as because... You see, if you're around for 20 or 30 years in this country, apparently that makes you good. So <laughs> these guys are like, you know, they're the most celebrated Irish uh, food people that we have just because they're around for so long. 
well, it was invited back to Ireland, uh, back to Killarney, to turn around and say, where do you see the future in, in food? It's, it's, it's actually all in craft beers. I think everybody should get in craft beers. Uh, and I stood up and discussed saying, you having a laugh? You turn around and said, this town was a shithole. And now here you are coming back, you know, telling us how to rescue ourselves. And another food critic turned around and said, before review the restaurant, gave us an absolute stunning review in the restaurant. And about six months later, I get contacted to say, uh, will you come into our guidebook? I said, okay, well, let's have this pre-recession now. So I said, okay, let's, let's have a look at what it is. So it's three and a half grand plus fat, right? And I was contacted in June. Somebody from last year might remember me telling me this story. It was three and a half grand plus fat. So I said, first of all, well, it's June, so I presume it's half price because we're halfway through the year. I said, well, no, we got to do your artwork and we got to do the book and print and blah. I said, okay, all right, fair enough. So next year, I presume it's half price as well. Well, no, no. That, I said, well, we're six months and one year and 12. Said, we got to do something. I said, well, actually, no, look, do you want to be in the book or not? So I said, I tell you what, who else in the town is going to be in it? Because there's another fella here and there's a plaque on every second door, which means his plaque isn't worth shit. So who else is going to have the plaque on their door? And I was told, you should be privileged. You should be privileged that you've been asked. I said, no, that's not how it works. I said, if I'm about to pay three and a half grand to be in your book, I need to know who else is going to be in the book. So one other person in town was in it. I told him I wasn't paying it. It was crazy. Not a chance. There's no sign of that little black book anywhere now. Do you think that you were asked because you're part of the same guys out there that are from South America? My, or buyers from South No. My genuine reason as to why I think I was asked is because I was given a good review in the newspaper. And of course, I would have just given the cash straight away. But I said, oh, geez, thanks a million for giving me the great review. It was a bit of a tit for tat. That's if I was being very cynical, which I am. And I'm normally right. <laughs> so that's pretty much why I was asked for it. Another famous restaurant critic. So she's barred as well, that other one. This other guy, who's apparently the greatest connoisseur in the country, right? Probably self-proclaimed, and I probably exaggerated. Actually, I haven't. Is also full of shit and barred. Because he had a wine testing on a radio station one day. Four different reds. Tried them all. Oh, lovely. It's a Malbec. Oh, that's Chilean. Oh, that's Cab whatever, that's a Shiraz, that's whatever. How did I get on? Not only did he get all four wrong, it was the same bottle of wine. <laughs> okay? Now this guy is preaching to us about <coughs> wine. He was yeah. on a restaurant, because I remember why there was two critics always on I'm not going to disagree with you, let's put it that way. You're, you're certainly not far wrong, and you're probably right, somewhere in between. If you, if you don't know what they look like, how can you bargain? How can you itch? Bargain. How can I bargain? Well, you all know what you see. You see, there was a day when restaurant critics were anonymous. And that's the day they didn't sell anything. And now they're selling stuff. And now we all know who they are. Well, you can go into a restaurant with somebody's merchant and say, look, you see that? Is Absolutely, yeah, yeah. There's one of the top. They, they become celebrities in their own right? Yeah, yeah. And, and for what reason? Because, go back to what I'm saying, is that they're on every magazine. They're on every newspaper. And here's the most important thing. See, I'm very lucky. I don't really give a shit about it much because I don't have to answer to anybody apart from the bank manager. But I don't need to go back after today and have a boss turn around and say, what in the name of God did you say there earlier? And you Facebook lied did you clown so everybody can see it. What is it called? <laughs> the damage limitation. If somebody sees this and goes, oh, I'm never going to his restaurant, which has happened on many occasions, especially the way I answer back TripAdvisor reviews. But I'm never going to your restaurant. Great, you were never coming anyway. You know, so I mean, I'm not really too pushed. However, there's also a lot of people who actually like, admire and respect the way I'm calling these guys out. But these restaurant critics now are, like they're, they're everywhere and everybody knows who they are because ultimately they want to get on the magazines, they want to get on the books, they want to have their guides, but they also know that a lot of restaurants want to feed from the crumbs off their table. So, which is a point I'll get to now in a sec, is that better not piss them off because there is a chance I might get a good review. Even if I'm down in Clonakilty as a restaurant critic, I might have gone to the quality hotel, but I might put two lines in my review saying, I hear the quality hotel is great for families. Simple like that. But if the boss man from the quality hotel has called them out for being an idiot, well, there's no way they're going to get a review. So, what, so where do we stand? But nobody's calling these guys out. I don't understand what, yes. Do they ever pay for the meal or they all pool up? They, no, they'll always pay for their meal because they're getting it back in expenses. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, having said that, I thought you were going to ask me a totally different question. Does somebody pay for their reviews? Well, I'm cynical. So. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. It's it, obviously depending on the critic. 
but there's no doubt about it, there is a massive spin-off afterwards. So for example, we were done once from, I think it was the Irish Examiner, and we have a dish that's on in the restaurant, we can't get it anymore, but we had guinea fowl done with a wild mushroom sauce. That's what Dad cooked for Elvis. So I was talking away to this guy, and I actually didn't know who he was. It was only when he gave me his credit card, I saw the name, and I went, oh, that name looks familiar. And I turned around and explained to him, I said, oh, Dad cooked for this on Elvis on the trains when Elvis was in the army, blah, 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 going between Switzerland and Germany and all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, it's on the review. Elvis ate this. He didn't just eat toasted burgers and whatever else he ate, whatever. But he, he always ate something decent or something. So for the next three or four weeks, it was the number one selling dish in the, in the restaurant was the guinea fowl with the wild forest mushroom sauce, just because somebody had wrote that down. So, I mean, there is no doubt about it. The pen is far mightier than the sword. But the whole bigger scale of it is, so what are these restaurant critics? You know, are they genuine? Are, like, I mean, are these people that we should be looking up to? And is there some sort of alternative motive behind it? So, therefore, does that mean, you know, what they're doing is a little bit dodgy? I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. I said, don't think like me, just think. Well, I think one of the interesting things is, and I will admit I haven't been to a restaurant. I have to do it. It's quite right. And, but... Is a lot of these reviews of the restaurants that I, as an average person, wouldn't go to because I couldn't afford to go to it. It would be a very special occasion. And if I'm going somewhere for a very special occasion, I will go through personal reviews. But somebody said to me, I've been there, it's been consistently excellent, I will go for a special occasion. I'm not going to be paying 200 quid for a normal Saturday night meal. Exactly. Nor would I. You know, Absolutely. And, and that's the thing, and that's why I just wonder with so many of these reviews, I mean, Sicily years ago and we went there was only one Michelin star restaurant and normally I'm not into that because I actually want to go in dressed like this in a pair of jeans and just chill out and relax mm. I have no interest in this arty farty stuffy shite mm. anyway but we said we were away for two weeks and we said we go to Sicily or we, we go to the, the Michelin star restaurant and we had a horrible meal an absolute horrible meal because your expectation is so high right. correct that's a huge thing for, for the punter going in it's all about your expectation you're dead mm. right so if you're expecting that and you don't get it you're let down if you're expecting that and it's there you go wow that was you, if you go into a little cafe and you know you're a nice little Absolutely, yeah. But that's enough to do. Yeah. You go into, yeah, if you say Michelin star restaurant, yeah. and everything is a spot on before you've even started the meal, you're disappointed. Absolutely, and you're off on the wrong foot. But as we were walking back, there was this small, I, I said to my wife, Elaine, I said, I think that's a restaurant in there. I said, there's too many different people sitting on tables outside. It looks like a house, but it's, I said, sorry, is this a restaurant? Said, yeah, but all we do is pasta. I said, can we book for tomorrow night? Said, there's no reservations. And I said, I'll tell you what, we'll arrive in. I said, I'll be there at the bar. I'll sit outside. As soon as the table for two comes up, give me a shout, we'll be over. And all they had was about five or six different pasta dishes. And it was the nicest pasta. It was just the most amazing dish ever that I'd ever had. And I turned around to her and I said, the Michelin guy got it wrong. Is it, how do you go to 100 yards up the road to your man? This is serious food. And again, it's like what you said. It's having just simple ingredients. You cook them right. So, like, uh, yes. Yeah, I was just going to repeat uh, uh, a thing that you're pointing to. Like, sometimes you go into a restaurant and you just see the description. It's like, and a bread of pasta with all this thing. You're like, oh my God, it sounds so amazing. And then you actually see it, and it's like, okay, that's not the vision I had in my head from the description. Do you know who's brilliant to that? Well, McDonald's. Have you ever seen the pictures that are behind the camera? <laughs> yeah. It's photographs. Uh, it's photographs that you would... You I just want there. somebody, anywhere in the world, it could be Bangladesh, I don't care where, somebody put their hand up and say, I actually got a burger that looked like that, yeah. that's on the picture. It just doesn't exist. Okay, but again... Cardboard, aren't they? <coughs> Do it. Some of those are actually made up, they're not actually food, they're actually cardboard. Oh, absolutely, yeah, there's these, what do they call them, food, they were there. Oh, we have the food stylist. Food stylist. Food stylist, where are you? Oh, you're a food stylist. No, I've done a bit, but not anything serious. All right. Well, but, but you're dead right. A lot of it isn't food. It's plastic. It's cardboard. It's paint. It's everything. It's it's all mind trickery and all. But that's that's a whole bigger picture, which I'm going to be talking about now in a second about processed food. But the other thing is that um, there are quite a number of rich people in this country who have more money than sense, <laughs> <laughs> and so they're not like normal people. And, and they will pay maybe to be seen in a particular restaurant. Absolutely. They won't be at the surname. They won't be looking at the price or anything like that. Yeah. You know? I mean, how many, how many people like that are there around? What percentage? Oh, geez, I, I, I have no idea, but there's too many of them. Yeah. Uh, it's, not, it's not the percentage of how much influence they have. Yeah, I mean, look, again, a new place opens. It's got a big 
media, you see, you got, you got to understand as well, a lot of what we're seeing is being paid for, so therefore, in my opinion, it's not legit. So there's an awful amount of PR companies out there that these guys are paying a serious lot of amount of money to every single year to have their name out there, to be on the TV shows, to be on the radio, to be on the magazines. And the PR <coughs> companies are probably the guys who are making the most amount out of it, because at the end of the day, how much like is it worth? If you're spending 20, 30, 40 grand on the PR to be out there, are you recuperating that? I don't know. But you're right. I mean, if, if, so if a new place opens up to a huge fanfare, of course you want to be seen there, don't you? I mean, hey, I'm cool and trendy and hip. Speaking and of the, the Frozen restaurant, that yeah. you I find it fascinating when you see the, the, the so-called audience, the, the so-called clientele who are just coming in to have the meal. And you wonder how many of them there are actually interested in the food. They're there because they're going to dress up and be on telly. And be seen, absolutely. Yeah. 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 There's yeah. very few that actually go ahead and scream and say, oh, that's all right. Yeah. They're not going to say well, that on TV. And, and, you hear, and you hear some of their comments and you think, and I mean, I don't profess, I, I'm, I'm somebody who enjoys my food. I'm not yeah. saying that I profess to know much about it. But you know, you see, you, you've never, they, they don't, they actually know very little about food. You can see it in some of their comments. And, yeah. and they're full of it. They're, absolutely. They're absolutely full of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas, you know, but how did Joe Soap walk the street to, you know, maybe never tasted some yeah. of this stuff before, but yeah, that's. Well, as I said last year when I finished up, I said if one person leaves the audience here and goes out and, and says, Do you know what, actually, your man makes sense. And he, so I'm going to be a little bit more, you know, you're full of shit to people. You know, I said if only one person does and it has a knock-on effect. Our problem is, is that for some unbeknownst reason, we're afraid to stand up and we're afraid to call these guys out. Why? Who are they? They're nobodies. Nobody different. Nobody special. If somebody's doing something wrong, call them out. This TV show, and, and the way the world has gone out, you're too busy. This is what everybody's been told. You're too busy. Don't have time to cook. You have such a hectic life. That's all we're hearing in all walks of life. You don't even, like, just buy one dress and the, you don't have to waste time what I'm going to wear. This is all this shite that we're hearing that's been put into our heads, which has led to 30-minute meals, 20-minute meals, 15-minute meals, and 5-minute meals was the last one that I was watching. A whole series of 5-minute meals. Now, I took serious issues with this for the simple reason it was a six-part episode and all six of them were either stone cold or raw. And I'm looking at this and going, hang on a second here now. No, 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 somebody needs to call you out for being seriously full of shit. And not only being seriously full of shit, but also being dangerous. Because there was a full lemon sole who was cooked for 2 minutes and 34 seconds. On the bone. Taken out and put on the plate. You've seen me go mad about this on Twitter. Put on the plate and says, there you are now, lads, let's go cook it. Now, I've cooked hundreds, if not thousands, of lemon sole, snip sole, Dover sole, or whatever. There is no way in hell, on the bone, you can cook that fish in two minutes and 34 seconds. Not a chance. Now some gobshite tried to challenge me, which was a mistake starting off straight away. Ha, wait, you hear the question, this is phenomenal. This is, this is the level of intelligence you're dealing with followers of these guys that are full of shit. How did you know it was on the bone? <laughs> That's the question, a lemon soul. How did I know that was on the bone? That's like asking, how do you know that chicken has a beak? I can fucking see it. They haven't a clue. So the, the reality was, was that if you had a cook into that lemon sole, it would have been raw on both sides, on both sides of the fish. The next thing was picked up, here's my lovely ribeye steak. Actually, that's a sirloin steak. It's not a ribeye steak. That's the next one. The next one is, here's my pad thai, stone cold. You could see it was stone cold. Here's my rump of lamb. I like to cook it pink. That's fucking red raw. That's not pink. And here's the most important thing, is you can't cook a rump of lamb like that because it's just, it's like eating the chair. You have to cook it more. But this is what everyone's going, oh my God, who asked me earlier on? Like, are we watching for the food or are we watching for the celebrity guy? And everyone's like, so nobody's cooking that rump of lamb. And what's worse, if some person does and takes it out raw as that and goes, oh God, I'm nowhere near as good as him. What mistake? He didn't make a mistake. You copied him exactly. It's his was shit too. So that's why... This is, what are we looking at? So is nobody going to stop these guys? Is nobody going to, why? If you want a five minute meal, roast two chickens yesterday and throw the breast <laughs> in the microwave for five minutes tomorrow. It's your five minute meal. If you want to make a five minute meal, do a big pot of bolognese, freeze it down when it's cold and take it out and hit it in with a bit of pasta. Here's your five minute meals. Not too busy. That's, she's like our parents, well, I don't know about your guys, but my, my parents had four, six, eight, ten kids that they had to come home and cook and bring everywhere and do this. We still got food put on the plate every single day. There was none of this, mom, take my lemon soul, two minutes, oh, geez, I'm too busy here, eat it raw. <laughs> shit <in place. laughs> but we're putting up with this because nobody is calling them out for being full of shit. But then, if they're, if they're actually serving raw food, don't 
collision, so mm -hmm. you don't see any of this. That's why you're then, so relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but then, our food safety authorities have actually got the responsibility to watch these programs and get them taken off. Do you know what the ironic thing is? Some of our so-called government bodies are sponsoring these shows. Yeah. You were saying earlier about that guy doing all the tennis matches and they're doing it wrong. Yeah. Surely people like Roma or Weber owns those brands of tomatoes. They must look at it and going, you're ruining our brand and that's actually going to cause a big effect long term. To be honest, they don't see it that way. So if two people watch a TV show, one person loves it and the other person hates it, you go back to the TV guy and go, 50% loved it, 50% hate it, don't give a shit, two people watch it. <coughs> so they'll turn around and they'll look at the numbers. And I don't think they're seen because they've been told through the world of social media, they've been told through all the magazines and all the newspapers that have spiraled from this bullshit from the very beginning, that this is a huge social influencer. This guy has a huge amount of followings. But surely the head, like the head of the company <coughs> or someone in the department who is looking at a bigger long-term plan thinking, yeah. you don't use it that way, that's not how we, that's not what we're in the market like, and kind of go overhead to the ones who want this fast track. You're 100% correct. Perception. You're talking about the, the undercooked lemon sorrel. I got salmonella from undercooked fish. Now, it was in Gambia, mm. and thankfully I realized before I ate any more than the mouthful I did, but I was fine at the meal for, for a good month or two and a half. But if somebody had eaten that lemon sorrel and got salmonella, mm -hmm. well, it, one, it would put you off fish for life, but two, I mean, what you should immediately be doing is registering for data that. Yeah, absolutely. Because people don't. They would sit there. Your, your GP was a responsible. Oh yeah, because yeah. when I when I came home, yeah, because I came it was the last day of the trip when I got some. I came home, when the results came back from my test from the doctor, I got a phone call from public health saying, "Where did you eat this fish?" Yeah. Um, so if if if, if that had happened in a restaurant, this restaurant would have been absolutely yeah. brought up. But yeah. Because I cooked it at home. Yeah. Oh, I just wouldn't eat fish there. Mm. But did you cook it out together? No, no, I, I, I was on, we were on a boat, we were sailing down the Ambia River. I mean, I was in Africa yeah. and all the rest of it, but everything else that we'd had was superb. Mm. It was just that it had been, it had been, it had been barbecued and it was not ready. Mm. I've heard, like, you know, you're not supposed to drink water in certain countries or eat certain things because even in Africa, the way they store it is different. But it's like they have a stronger constitution than yeah. they used and that, to. And well, going back to, that goes back to the mm. whole thing about eating dirt. We, yeah. we don't. Well, yeah. We're far, we're, we're far too clean and hygienic, and that's Absolutely, why yeah. don't take it. I can tell you, just a side track, I went to Ecuador with my sister. The whole time we were there, we did drink bottled water, we did because we were told it was a good idea, but she cleaned her teeth with bottled water. Everything she did was with bottled water. I cleaned my teeth with a local, I'd, I'd run the tap, see what it was like. I cleaned my teeth with, she was the one who had to go to the doctor with me tested out. There you go. And I do believe that a little yeah. bit of what's bad for you is good for you. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but so uh, saying that people don't complain is actually the opposite to reality. People complain even if they haven't got to the restaurant, and restaurants have to cope with that. Cope with that. But that's Carry nice on. to say they complain at your restaurant. No, no, but, but what I'm saying but is, you could so or at home, no, you but, die, but no, you but that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that people go to a restaurant and sometimes claim. Oh, that what they ate yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. makes them sick, and then the restaurant has to deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. And they're actually making up the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's. There must it, be an element of truth, surely. Yeah, well, you, you can thank TripAdvisor for that because yeah, yeah, now anybody can go on to. Compliance yeah. is that social media, when I work in the restaurant field, yeah. is so responsible for all, all sorts of things going wrong because we can't keep compliance. Completely agree with you. The bodies cannot yeah. monitor all of that. Completely agree with you. Yeah, but they're pr probably agnostic truth, or they're probably SEO companies that work for a rival. Well, I'll tell you now how TripAdvisor has gone full circle. So before, you have a restaurant, I have a restaurant, I don't like your restaurant, I'm going to log on and say, I had a horrible meal at a restaurant, absolutely the worst meal ever, don't go there, blah, 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 blah. Somebody sees this one bad review. They might do it three or four times. The new way of killing your competitor on TripAdvisor has gone, I had the most amazing meal in your restaurant. Boom. I had the most amazing meal in your oh, restaurant. Boom. Sad. And I'm going to put 20 reviews from the same IP address TripAdvisor are going to say, hang on a second, the owner must be at something here and he's putting up that he's a brilliant restaurant, but it's your competitor. So we're going to bump him down 20 or 30 places. That's a new way to kill your competitor in, in, in TripAdvisor.
But TripAdvisor, again, is the biggest pile of shit because they don't care about the restaurant tour. So you've never eaten in my restaurant yet. You can put on your, if you were to put on a review in my restaurant now, before I finish here, it will be up. And you can say anything you want about it. I see that review and I go, hang on a second. Uh, you forget one big thing. We were there too that night. This person was never in the restaurant. So I send my concern to TripAdvisor and say, hey, lads, uh, this person never ate in my restaurant. It's a competitor. It goes to a bot, a robot, basically. And it goes through a thing and it goes, no, 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 no. I hit all the guidelines. There's no bad words. There's no real content. There's no, yeah. no, it's fine. It stays up. So you can put a one-star review and you never even ate with me and me as the owner. So I turn around and say, I think you're a shit for doing this. Oh, that's against our guidelines. Has to come down. But then that's one of the other th I things I look, there have been some great examples of the responses yeah. to TripAdvisor. And they, those go viral on Facebook. Well, I, I slate and, all and the guys. And that's where you get the bad, the, 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 Absolutely. the bad. Absolutely. So how you turn the bad totally turn into the good. And we get a lot of people coming into the restaurant because of how. Yeah. I, so we would one guy who turns around and said, I've been in your restaurant four times. Each time it was crap. So I said, what, have you got the memory of the goldfish? What, first, second, third time? Have you forgotten that it was shit? Why'd you come back a fourth time? You know, and so there's all these kind of stuff. So yeah, but again, a lot of places, as you said, I have no accountability in the sense that I can put up whatever I want. If it backfires, it's all my fault. But if you're the head chef or the restaurant manager, I put up this, oh, you got a memory of a goldfish, and then all of a sudden there's a massive backlash. How dare you speak to your customer like that? Say, hey, what are you doing? It's not your restaurant. It's my restaurant. You can't do things like that. So a lot of people won't do it. So I get the amount of times when I slate, openly slate, that I think your man is full of it, I think she's full of it, that's not cooked, this, blah, 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 whatever the hell. I get all these messages from all these other chefs saying, fair play to you. And I go, don't send me a private message. Come out and say, fair play to you. Don't do it publicly. And so well, we can't because there could be a potential backlash. So I turned down three different festivals that I'm supposed to be cooking on stage with somebody. And I turned around and said, I'm not, I'm not gonna cook on stage with somebody. I said, why not? I said, well, it was the same person twice and a different person. And I said, because you'll have an MC in the middle there, and all well, you do this, and Joe Bloggs, you do that. And all of a sudden, you're going to turn around, how do you think that is? I'm going to say, it's, well, that's fucking raw. And he said, imagine being in a food festival and saying, your man's shit, nah, that's shit. I said, I'm not going to do it because I can't keep my mouth shut. I said, I have to say, it's not right or wrong or good or bad or indifferent, but it's what I think, and, that, and that's crap. So I've turned them down. And I have a huge issue in this country as well with some of our top chefs, the likes of... Wade Murphy's, JP's, Ross's, all the top seriously talented guys who are putting up with this shit all the time in food festivals and not calling these guys out. That's just as bad as the guy, the guy who's doing it. Fair play to you if you can get away with it. I have no problem. Probably the nicest guy in the world. I'm nothing personal against you. If you can, can calm the people, belt away. But the guys who know what they're talking about, who aren't calling them out, that's just as bad as these guys in the first place. Because we're out saying we've got the finest produce in the world. We're out saying we've got some of the greatest chefs in the world, but we're not going to call out the bullshit. Big problem. I guess you're, in a way, you're protecting your brand because, like you said, if you're standing next to someone who you know is substandard and they're standing next to you, eventually you will get out that they're really bad and that will pass on to you because you will be thought. Yeah, you'd, you'd like to think, hello? <laughs> You'd, uh, you'd like to think that that's, but for some unbeknownst reason, to date, I haven't seen that materialize. I haven't seen that it's damaging somebody's brand. So these top guys, as I'm saying, well, if we go along with the fellow who's the nouveau guy at the moment, if we go along with that, well, we might get a mention, we might get something on a paper, we might get asked onto the TV with them, we'd probably get asked to a festival because of them, and we just go along with it. And I'm looking and going, so what, we're just all fake? It's just, it's, it's all, is it all bullshit? Maybe that's just the way it should be. I don't know. <laughs> As I said, don't think like me. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe these guys are all right. There are two types. I think we mentioned it briefly on our earlier meeting call. Like, there are two types of reviews. There's the ones that review for the, like, the big high-end aristocrats almost of the world, who, like, emperors need clothes, and they're saying, oh, this is great because, you know, my <coughs> You know, most uh, most people, ordinary people, won't kind of go to a restaurant based on what they heard. If I went to a restaurant, I didn't like the food, I'd kind of go, don't go there, it's mm. just horrible. And most people would kind of go better by word of mouth than by what... Absolutely. Just, which yeah. is what TripAdvisor really also used to have to do. Well, they say we're bringing word of mouth into a bigger environment. Well, we, we now live in a world where everybody has a platform to criticise, mm -hmm. whether they know what they're talking about or whether they don't. We now live in a world where popularity is more important than doing it right. So it doesn't matter. So if somebody wants to put money behind, look at what we've got. We've got these models that are now self-proclaimed expert chefs. We've got athletes that are chefs. Next month, we've got a guy who's a presenter on TV3 coming out with a cookbook who was on MasterChef, 
who couldn't cook for shit, and he's coming out with a cookbook in a month's time. Why? Well, because somebody's paying for it, and somebody's promoting it, and somebody's getting behind it. <laughs> Yeah, Delia Smith. And brilliant. Me how to do something Did like you ever notice? Delia Smith is nothing like IKEA. When you cook her recipe, mm -hmm. you have nothing left bar the food. IKEA, you assemble stuff. You've got three screws and a piece of wood. Like, <laughs> the fuck do I do wrong? You look at these guys' cookbooks yeah. and you say, "How have I got shit left? How? It doesn't make no sense. I've, I've used what they told me to do, and I've, I still have stuff left. It makes absolutely no sense." Do you think that the uh, rash? We have a serious problem in our industry with no chefs coming into it. Really? Huge, huge problem. For a, a couple of different reasons. And I'm not going to for a second listen to the bullshit, oh, your pay is shite. Because the pay was always shite. When I went into it, I was getting £75 a fortnight. And I worked 80 hours a week. And I didn't give a damn because I had a job. And the bonus I got was they did my laundry. So I was never out. So all they were doing was they were cleaning one pair of jeans and two chefs' uniforms a week, and that was my bonus. I didn't give a shit. I had a job. If I put up a big thing on Facebook at the start of the season, where are you? Where are the guys in college? Where are the young guys in fifth and sixth year? I was sent to Switzerland when I was 14. to go. Now, I was going over to work with my dad's cousin, but I was sent on my own, on the plane, got into Zurich, had to get the train from Zurich to Freiburg. I had no clue where I was going. If I just turned around and asked somebody, I know it was a different world. It was... I was going to say 20, ooh, it was fucking 30 years ago. But it was like, you just had to go fend for yourself. And you worked and you worked and you came home with money and that was it. All you hear now on the radio, oh, accommodation is so expensive. This is so expensive. That's it. None of you are working. So I put up this ad on Facebook to say that the youth of today, in my opinion, they don't seem to want to work. Because I haven't had one single person come in looking for a job all year. Not one. Where are you? All of a sudden, radio station picks up on it. And I said, look. I don't want mummies coming in with their CV because I'll probably hire the mum. I'm not going to hire the person who's brought in the CV. And if you come in, I said, there's a good chance, have a good look in the mirror. You're going to say, how do you know if I'm dressed well? There's a good look chance if you look in the mirror, you need to change. Because how you think looks great for a job interview is not how I think. And you've got to remember one critical thing. I'm the guy who's hiring. So your first impression is the most important thing. So if you've got ripped jeans, if you've got your ear pierced, oh, you have to include everybody. Bullshit. In the restaurant industry, I want somebody who looks clean and smart outside on the front because the customer, it's not me who's judging, it's the customers. So I want to have somebody who's going to put across a good, clean front. I said, and I. Why is Surf Bar window, given that tourism is such a big deal? Why, why is which? Surf? Why was Surf Bar window? Well, I'd be the first person to say we have the most inept politicians for the last 100 years. But why? Like, what was the rationale? Why was Surf Bar window? Because somebody turned around and went, it's cost us money. Again, you think like that, but for some unbeknownst reason, our politicians can't seem to look beyond that. They're looking at bottom line. But is it also now that, like, um, it's not just the food industry, it's like plumbers, right? It's everything. It's yeah. 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 yeah, but you see, you have to understand. And that's not degree, like, everyone wants to have a degree and a master's. And was it a big piece of paper? And half the time you wonder, people coming out of UCC, they just sit in their lectures, copy everything, and whether it's written or not. But everyone wants now a paper degree or a PhD and a master's and everything. Well, I tell you, a huge problem is because of these so-called social influencers, the young and the youth of today think that they can Snapchat, that they can tweet their way to success. They can turn around and take pictures of them looking like an absolute idiot. Somebody's going to pick up on it and they're going to make money out of it. They're going to be on TV. They're going to be on magazines or whatever. So some fundamentals in life never change. You've got to work your ass off and you've got to start at the bottom. And as simple as that. And most importantly, you have to not be afraid to get your hands dirty. If you can do that, and that's whether in any profession. So this 16-year-old kid came in after I did the, the interview on the radio. And he came in to me and he just had this great big smile on his face. And he said, I'm really sorry, I have no experience. I said, give a shit about that. I said, you're going to get experience here. I said, but here's the deal. You're going to work your ass off. And you're going to work every day. You know, you're getting your two days off. But you're going to work every day. I don't want to hear that you're going on holidays. I don't want to hear this because I've got three months where I need to make my money for the year. And you're either in with that or you're not. Take your pick. He said, I actually have a week's holiday booked. It's the first time our family's gone on holidays in seven or eight years. 
I said, okay, that's fair enough. No problems. We make out with you. We'll do without you for, for that week. But otherwise, you work. It's weekends, it's nights, it's this, it's that. No problems. I put up a post on Facebook there about two weeks ago to say, I came, put up a call looking for a guy and this guy answered it. One of the best guys I've ever hired. Nothing, nothing was too much for them. The first thing I said to him is, I'm telling you now, this is the most important lesson you're gonna get in here. Do not take anything personally. Because at some stage, on some night, when service is in the shits, there's a good chance I might fucking tear you apart. I said, just in one ear and out the other, okay? So I need to, I just, it's, it's steam. It happens maybe twice in the year. If you get it, pay no attention. If he gets it, he knows not to pay any attention. And he got torn out of it one night by the restaurant manager. And I went up to him afterwards, because at the end of the day, he's only 16. I said, are you all right? He said, you told me to take nothing personal. I said, yeah. I said, well, I took my bollocking and off I went. <laughs> I said, I'm telling you now, you can work anywhere. The greatest kid I've ever seen. We got a massive response. And everyone said, oh, fair play to you for, for uh, you know, saying that he, that he did so well. It was nothing. He deserved it. The guy worked really well. And you can have somebody comes in, I got this and I want Friday night off and I have to finish at 8 o'clock. Useless for my trade. No good. So if you come in demanding X, Y, and Z, I'm not going to hire you. But if some guy comes in and says, I have no experience, I don't know what to do. I said, I'll show you how to do everything. I can't carry one plate. I guarantee you by the end of summer you can carry four. So don't worry. And this guy's gone back to school and he's made his money every week. And did any of his mates in school work? None. He's got maybe two and a half, three grand for the summer saved up. If he does that next year and the following year, he's not going to be pissing and moaning about how much his rent is because he'll have it. But we've got this... He's, he's only in fifth year. He's only gone into fifth year. Guy was in transition year. Which proves the point that if you get these guys and teach them, there's no such thing as a bad kid. There's no such thing as a kid who doesn't want to work. It's just a kid who's living in an environment who thinks and believes. Parents don't give out to anybody anymore. We just, you, can't, you have to include it, but it's a fact. You can't, you look at a soccer pitch or a Gaelic match. You have to play every single kid because mm, you have to give participation medals to everybody. Why? Why? What are, we, what are we rewarding you for? What have you done? Are we rewarding you for being shit? Are we rewarding you for not caring? Should you get the exact same as the guy who's bursting his ass day in, day out in training? That's a whole other debate. That's one of the worst things they ever said, was it, it's not the winning that's counted, it's yeah, the performance. Yeah, 100%. Life is about winning. Absolutely. You, you, you've got to win that job, you've got to win that contract, you've got to win whatever it 100%. is. hundred percent. If you don't learn very early on what disappointment is like, it does have to be the get up and go, you know, go back. How, how can you appreciate success if you've been rewarded for not being successful? And there was some my, my niece had yeah. just done her leaving cert. She didn't work. Want to go to college yet? She would like to go at some point. Not 100% sure what she wants to do, but she was going to take the year out. She has now started work. She's working, doing functions in the evenings in one of the hotels, and she's working the O'Brien sandwich shop during the day. Now that's going to be. She is perfect. Uh, two weeks of it already. She is going to be knackered by the end of this. But it'll stand for. She'll know what work is about. Absolutely. And, and we couldn't be more proud of her. And Brilliant. she feels like you have done hard work. And feels yeah. Like and she's, and she's got both those jobs herself, went into mm. them and said, look, I'm looking for work. No experience, yeah. nothing. As you said. Anyway, I'm going to wrap it up because I'm conscious of time. So I want to finish on my typical Billy Connolly point. That I started on a story, and I don't know if any of you remember it. I started on a story, then I go off on a rant, which I've pretty much done. But I'll eventually come back to the point. I started off by saying I'm going to give you the origins of two words. Where they come from and why you shouldn't deem them to be bad words anymore. Because they're actually only abbreviations. Total bollocks. The reason I said that to you is because when you have an audience, you have an obligation to be honest, thorough, responsible, and truthful. And what you're telling these people has to be true. So if I didn't tell you that the origins of those two words weren't bullshit, there's a good chance one of you might have been sitting in a pub later on and gone, oh, wait till I tell you this. Do you know where the word fuck comes from? And it wasn't true. And all of a sudden, more and more people would be talking about this. So when you hold up a sirloin steak and tell people it's a ribeye, you have an obligation. If you're telling people that fish is cooked and it's not, you have an obligation. If your sauce has split and you don't know that your sauce has split, you have an obligation. So that's why, till the day I die, and even my kids give me shit every single day saying, Dad, why do you watch this on TV when it's wrecking your head? Because my father worked too damn hard growing up as an apprentice, and all the people who went up before, who learned the hard slog, who learned the hard work, they work too damn hard, and I respect them way too much to let some little shit come out on social media and go, look at my hollandaise sauce, when all it was was an egg, a bit of hard butter, and a squeeze of lemon juice. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, um, thanks very much, Paul. Now, don't forget, 
as you go in to have some lemonade and food and fizzy fudge from Mella, you are also obliged to color talk <laughs> and say anything that you couldn't say sitting there to him. <laughs> and disagree to your heart's content. And we've got 10 minutes. I know it's short time, but we're already 15 minutes over. Groyne has been great. My phone is out of battery. Groyne has keeping me on track. And we'll be back to Niamh, who is, we're thrilled to welcome from Cork. I know traffic has been a nightmare. Carry on an original hand. Oh, well, you know what? Okay, you can't color, you can't, you can't color fall on the top. There you go. Okay. Let me know what you think of that one, guys.